Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. <clears throat> uh, I've got some more pictures to show you. Um, of evidence. There are, there are structures in this world that do not make sense if you don't believe the Bible. Now, if you believe the Bible, you look at them and go, I, I could see how that could happen. But if you don't believe the Bible, uh, some things I'm going to show you tonight, you'll go, you're not ever going to convince me that Stone Age man using soft metal tools, carved out some stone blocks with such precision that you literally cannot slide a piece of notebook paper between the stones. That's how precise these stones were set in place. All right, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But let's start out with Genesis 6, and we'll read our sort of our foundation text. And uh, we're talking about giants, the sons of God, the daughters of men. What does the Bible mean? Why is this story even in the Bible? Why do we need to know this? Well, there's, a, <clears throat> I believe, a very important reason. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. What that means is, in those days means before the flood, and also after that means after the flood. Because if the flood of Noah washed and scoured the earth clean from all its defilement, from all these giants, we know then there were giants in the days of David, in the days of Moses and Joshua, so where did they come from? Well, verse 4 tells you. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And I want you to focus on, on that last part as well. Mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Maybe uh, next Sunday we'll look into the various uh, stories from around the world, stories told about giants and where they came from, how they got here. Are these fables? Are they make-believe stories? I used to read about Jack and the Beanstalk. And Jack had magic beans and his mother tossed them out the window and the next day there's this beanstalk that's all the way up into heaven and Jack climbs it and he sees a giant living up there, fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman, and so on. So do these stories, are they all make-believe or do they have at least some basis in reality? Well, the Bible's telling you in verse 4, yes, these are men of renown and I can tell you that every, every civilization that's ever lived, every culture, every ancient civilization, they all have a flood story and they have giants that they believed in and dragons that they believed in. So the Bible's right. The Bible's going to tell you the truth. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for a good day. Uh, Father, we pray for Brother Roy tonight. We pray, God, that you would, um, uh, Lord, that you would be kind to him. And we thank you, Lord, that you're bringing him out of whatever it was that afflicted him. And, Lord, you know the desire of his heart is to be near his wife. 
And I pray, God, that somehow, some way, you would work that out for him. And Father, we love him. We love Sister Bonnie. We want those two people to be together because of the love that they have for one another. And Father, Lord, let their life and their love for one another be an example to those of us who come after them. Lord, I, I want my marriage to last as long as theirs is and even longer. And I thank you, God, for keeping these people together uh, all of these years because that gives us younger people hope that, God, you still do that. So, Father, we, we love Bonnie, we love Roy. We ask you, God, to bless them uh, during this time. Bless all of our people who cannot be here tonight. Pray, God, that you would give them encouragement and grace. Father, teach us, God, that we can believe this Bible. It's right, and there's really nothing in this world, the truth be told, that actually contradicts what this book is really all about. So increase our faith tonight. Show us some good things, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Uh, look up on the screen. This is in South America. And if just by guessing, how big would you say from this particular picture, how big would you say these particular stones are? Anybody want to take a guess? If you already know, don't say. But if you're just by looking at them, how big would you say, let's see that middle row of stones. Okay, there's three rows there. That middle row of stones, how big would you say those stones are? Anybody want to take a guess? Huh? 20 feet? Anybody think that's too much? They look like bales of hay. Well, I didn't ask that question. Does anybody look, does anybody think there's bales of hay? Okay. Okay. They're not quite 20 feet, but they're big. Okay, and they're not, they're not thin either. Those are not just plates. They're probably about as wide as they are tall. Okay, but I want you to look at how they were put together. Okay. The first question in my mind is, why? Why did they shape each one of these stones the way they did and then how did they get the second the you know the layer that they put on top how did they get those stones to fit perfectly in with the lower level how did they do that because literally there is almost no gap in between them. You literally cannot put a piece of paper in between each one of these stones. You, you literally cannot do it. And in some cases, some of these stones have about six or seven or eight different angles on them. Like puzzle pieces, okay? But obviously, and here, there's something, something else here about these stones that they found out. I don't have a picture of them. But they noted on the top row of stones, whoever carved out these blocks to set them in place, Sterling, they put like a, a half of a bow tie notch on, on one stone and the other half of a bow tie notch on the other. And when they slit them together... Then they poured molten iron or steel or whatever they had. They poured molten metal in there. And when that metal hardened, they had automatic clamps to make sure that these stones never moved once they were set in place. Okay, Technology that, according to most of the universities in the world, Stone Age men did not have this kind of technology 
to not only carve them out and set them in place so close together, but to notch out, I don't know what they would call it, um, what, do they, what, do they, uh, what do they call it when they notch out wood so that it fits the dovetail? Yeah, no, dovetails, actually. They, they notched out a dovetail on each one of these stones so that all they had to do is pour molten iron in there, and when that iron set, those stones were not going anywhere, all right? Um, take a look. This is a close-up of just how close together these stones fit. Each one of them is beveled in, and then the, the joints where the two stones meet are absolutely perfect, perfectly smoothed joints. It, it almost looks like they were poured into a mold or somehow the stones were melted and fitted together in a molten state and then dried that way. But the bottom line is, like if you look right get my pen if you look like at this stone right here it, it fits in here perfectly and then it fits in here perfectly and then fits in with this stone perfectly and again there is no discernible gap like right here you've got a very tiny little notch here it goes down this way. There really is no discernible gap between these stones. They are fitted together that perfect. And this was done a few thousand years ago. By what means? By what technology? What technology quarried these stones? What technology moved these stones? What technology fitted these stones? And, and, and then, then the question is, why? I mean, it'd been much easier to make smaller stones that you can move out, set them up, use some kind of mortar system, whatever, to build a wall, but that's not how they did it. So we don't know, number one, how they did it. Number two, we don't even know why they did it that way, but somebody did. Uh, have you seen these before? This is Easter Island, which is the, off the western coast of South America. Easter Island has a particular beach on it called Anacana Beach. Now remember that word, Anacana Beach, because we're going to see that in a minute. But they don't know who carved out these images, brought them from the quarry and set these up. They're all over the island. Um... When you see the tops of these, they dug down and found out just how big they are. You see these guys standing next to this thing? Why they were buried, we don't know. But when they actually started digging some of them out, they realized just how vast and huge they were. And there's hundreds of them on this island off the coast of South America. Nobody knows why. So there they all are. This is what? Does anybody know what this is? Stonehenge, okay? Um, and there are uh, several of these monolithic sort of temple-like structures. They're around the world. Um, and they are perfectly aligned in such a way in that on the summer solstice and winter solstice every year, some of these stones have cracks in them. And on like the summer solstice, you have all the pagans, people come from all over the world to view the sun coming up on June 21st because the way these stones are aligned, the sun rises on June 21st at summer solstice right up one of these cracks and shines through to a particular spot in this temple area. So they knew it was some sort of astronomical tool. They knew that it was some sort of calendar tool. But more than likely it was also used 
as a temple of worship, all right? Uh, each one of these stones themselves weighing several hundred tons. I don't know exactly how big they are, but they're pretty big. Who put them there? Who lined them up the way they did and so on? This is really on my interesting list. Okay? There is a, uh, let me get an, sort of an outward view here. This, this whole hill side here is one solid piece of stone. This whole hill here. Somebody started at the top and started carving them, their way down through this one giant piece of rock. In other words, this temple that you see here is, was not carved out in pieces and brought and set in place. Somebody started at the top of this hill and started digging their way down, carving out this temple structure as they moved down through the rock, removing thousands of tons of gravel and debris, you know, chip offs from this. And the intricacy of this, this is in India, by the way, the intricacy of this temple is absolutely astonishing. All the lines are level. All, the, all these lines are level. All these lines are plumb. I mean, it's, it's about nearly as perfect as if each piece was carved individually and measured and then set in place. But that isn't how it was built. This is one rock. One great big gigantic rock that somebody carved out this entire temple structure out of it. There's a closer view. In other words, so they started here and they carved down and each time they got to an area, they carved in all these different animals, carved in all these pillars, these little windows, these gods were carved into it. They got to this layer here. They carved out a platform, but made sure they've got one, two, three rings there with these different animals here still carved out of this exact same piece of rock. None of it, none of it was broken off or carved somewhere else and brought in and put in place. And as they moved their way down, they carved the outer structures. Then they carved their way inside and carved inside these, this temple area here. They carved it out and carved it just as intricately as they did on the outside there you see this is the scale of it here's people here this is how big it is and nobody knows how it was done nobody knows how it was done have no clue who did it i'm not sure that modern man has the ability to do anything like that. I don't know we could do it now. Uh, this is sort of a lower view of it. The steps, they're all perfectly lined up, perfectly level, perfectly straight. Like I say, you have a bridge here that was notched out, meaning all of this rock here was notched out from underneath it. And then they notched inside this area here, put in windows, put in windows, put in all these little intricate designs, carved out the inside of this, like they did the inside of this and the inside of this and inside of this and carved an elephant here. And it boggles, it absolutely boggles my mind. I have no idea. Nobody knows how they did it. But there it is. So how do you answer things like this? What are these? Pyramids of Giza. Okay. Now something about, I won't get into all the math and the stuff like that of the pyramids of Giza, but somebody figured out a couple of years ago that the three pyramids of Giza from an overhead view are lined up perfectly with these three stars 
that are in Orion's belt. There's like two or three, I can go outside at night and I can point to you about two or three constellations. One of them's the Big Dipper, I can show you Polaris, the pole star, and I can show you Orion in the wintertime. And you can always spot Orion because it's like, a, it's like a, a rectangle with three stars in the middle, and that's supposed to be Orion's belt, which, by the way, is one of the few constellations actually mentioned in scriptures because the Bible specifically talks about the bands of Orion. Can you loose the bands of Orion? And the band of Orion refers to these three stars here that match perfectly the setting of the three pyramids of Giza. In other words, the me if you were to do a measurement of this star and this star and this star, they expanded that out and the tops of these three pyramids match perfectly the measurement and the distance between the three stars in Orion's belt. Okay? Uh, this here is called the Temple of the Sun, which is down in Mexico. It also is a pyramid. There's another one on this complex called the Pyramid of the Moon. Again, who built it? Nobody knows. Uh, but pyramids are found literally all over the world, including one that was located recently. For years, people looked at this and said, it's just a mountain, it's just a hill. The guy started looking at it and he said, now wait a minute. Here's the tip. How come this side and this side and this side and the one on the other side are all straight lines going down? And how come these areas on the sides of this mountain are almost perfectly smooth? And an artist did a rendering. There's a pyramid under those trees. It's called the Bosnian Pyramid. And it is actually larger than this one and this one. It is the largest pyramid ever. But for some reason it was covered up. There are pyramids that they found in China and the communist government sent some guys out there to cover those up with dirt and plant trees on them to cover up the pyramids to make them look like regular mountains. The problem is the guys they hired to plant trees on them, they planted trees all in straight rows. <laughs> they did. So it's like, really? See, that doesn't look natural. It looks fake. But for some reason, the Chinese government wanted them covered up. All right. Now what, let's go, let's go to Numbers 13, okay? So we have a, all of this is just proving how right this Bible is. Numbers 13 and Numbers 14. So in Numbers 13, Moses sent the 12 spies to spy out the land and, um, they came back, the Bible says, with their evil report. Two of them are saying, yes, we can go. Ten of them are saying, no, we can't. So let's look in verse, uh, look at verse 27 of Numbers 13. And they told him uh, and said, we came into the land whither thou uh, sendest us, and surely it floweth milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Remember that beach I told you about on Easter Island? Anakana Beach. Now, this is just my theory. My theory is that it has the name Anak in it. And that it's possible that remnants of the children of Anak were at Easter Island building those giant stone gods or whatever it was they were to guard that island. Okay? That's my theory. Um, the Sumerians wrote of a race of beings called the Anunnaki. And the Anunnaki were a hybrid species of 
the gods who mated with human women. That's who the Anunnaki were. And I think the word Anunnaki in Sumerian is the same word you're looking at here in your Bible, the children of Anak. They were the Anakim, in other words. The children of Anak. Verse 29, the Malachites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwelt by the sea in the coast of Jordan. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, or the Anakim, or the Anunnaki, which come of the giants. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, Numbers 14, here's how God's going to deal with this. We looked at Hebrews last Sunday night about the relationship that God's idea of salvation being related to the giant story. Because God basically says, it doesn't matter what it is that you don't believe me on. When you don't believe what I say, I can't give you the land that I promised because you don't believe what I say. And it doesn't matter how big the giants were. If God said, that land is yours, you can conquer them, God says, why don't you just trust me? Um, Brother Reg had me down at his church a couple years ago. I preached a message on a Sunday morning about the giants and the gospel. Uh, Reg told me when I was done, he said, Mike, that has to be the, probably the best message I've ever heard you preach. Because I took the idea of the, of the giants and I equated that to things that you and I have faced in life that we didn't think we were ever going to make it through. Things that we didn't think could be conquered. Things that were done that we didn't think could be done. Problems that we have, sins that we have, addictions that we have. By the way, um, you know, we've been trying to have our meetings on Thursday night and just one thing after another keeps coming up. So I decided if we can't get together, I'm going to do it anyway. So Thursday night, I did an addictions Bible study. Uh, it's online. Um, the day after I put it up, it had over 900 views. And I read some of the YouTube comments. Go read the comments from some of these people who have been or are still addicted to various things. And they are very thankful that somebody is giving them the gospel, somebody's giving them the power and the strength of the word of God, because all of these are giants to them. If you've ever been addicted to something, heroin or alcohol or whatever it is, it's something that you cannot beat yourself. But God can do it. God can easily do it, all right? So if you have not seen that, I encourage you to go online and, and watch it. So now Numbers chapter 14, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And I think if most of us were to be honest, I think probably at one time or another, we may have thought, you know, I was better off when I was living in sin than what I have to deal with now. At least then the devil left me alone. Don't trust that. Don't believe that. So look at verse 4. They said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Why? Because there were giants in the land. And if you remember back in the previous chapter, they made mention of their cities and their walls. God also said, when you get there, I want you to tear down their tabernacles and their temples. I want you to destroy them. 
And so undoubtedly, at least some of these pyramid structures, when Israel went into the various cities in the Promised Land, the Jews tore them down. Okay? But some of them they didn't. So they said, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. That captain, if you want to underline that, prophetically, that's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to take them back to Egypt. Jesus is going to take you out of Egypt. In verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of nobody, or none, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. It means it's so good, it exceeds good. It's better than good. No way to describe it. Verse 8, If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. What is rebellion equated to in the Bible? Witchcraft. It says the sin of witchcraft. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Joshua is saying, God's going to let us eat them for breakfast. I don't know what giants taste like. But Joshua's trying to convince them, look guys, they will fall in our presence. They will fall before us. We won't have to do anything. They're bred for us. Their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Uh-oh. Now God's showing up. Okay? They've done trip God's trigger. God's showing up there in the tabernacle. In verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long? How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. Underline that in your Bible. Disinherit them. Heaven is our inheritance. It is the promise that God has made to us as sons of God. But I, I look at this and I sort of equate that with Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 says, despise not the chastening of God in your life. God is your father. You're his child. God loves you. When you step out of line, God chastens you. Now, if you despise the chastening of the Almighty and won't let God correct you, then you are... The word bastard means disinherited. You are not getting the inheritance. I'm taking, God says, I'm taking you out of the will. And you get nothing. You won't get to see this land. Moses got to see it. But did God let him go into it? No. No. Not even Moses could. Out of this sum, six to seven hundred thousand adults that left Egypt, two of them walked into Canaan land. Two of them. That ought to scare you a little bit. Because truly straight is the way and narrow is the gate. And few there be that find it. Okay? Will God find you worthy? Will God, or will God disinherit you? Um, verse 12 again, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. And when you look at 
the difference between Jew and Gentile, the Jews, when Christ comes on the scene, they clearly act this thing out all over again. They reject the word of the Lord. They reject Jesus, the Son of God, the word of God. They reject him. And God says, fine, you're not going. I'm going to go out and I'm going to find people who will. And they're going to be Gentiles. And you're going to hate them and you're going to despise them. But I don't care. If you won't follow me, I'll find people who's never known me before. They'll follow me, I guarantee it. And that's how you and I are here tonight. So verse 13, And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egypt, Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in the night from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, for, for that, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by uh, daytime in a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will, will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he sware unto them, and therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, and forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Verse 19, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. Now, is Moses more powerful than God? Is Moses God's counselor? No, what Moses is doing is acting the part of Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is our advocate with the Father. That's what Moses is doing. And he's done this before. He did this at Mount Sinai because God said, I'm going to kill every Jew down there. And Moses went before God and said, God, blot my name out. Take me instead. I don't know that I would have said that, to be honest with you. It's like Moses saying, God, send me to hell, but spare them. I don't know that I would do that, but Moses did. And Moses is acting as Christ. He's acting as the mediator between God's people and God. God who is angry at his people for their sins. And yet the mediator pleads for us on our behalf to his father and says, Father, don't destroy them. You ought to get out on your knees every now and then and tell Jesus thank you. That you haven't been destroyed so far. That God hasn't torn you limb to limb. Amen. Because that's what Moses did. So the verse 20. And the Lord said I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles. Which I did in Egypt and in the wickedness and have tempted me now these ten times. See the number ten. It's the law. Just like the ten spies that came back and said, you can't go. Now they've tempted God ten times. Ten is always going to represent the law, which will never get you salvation, all right? But they've provoked God these ten times and have not hearkened unto my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now look at verse 24. This is where it really got me. But my servant Caleb... Because he had another spirit with him. And hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereunto he went. And his seed shall possess it. It has to do with what spirit leads and guides you. If you want to be led to heaven by God's mercy then this is the spirit you ought to be following and the spirit you ought to be full of and the spirit you ought to be f listening to. Amen? But it's a different spirit than what A, the world has and B, what the fake Christians have. The spirit in us causes us to just believe what God said. Suppose they were to come up with some almost foolproof evidence that man literally did evolve from monkeys. 
I won't believe it. You shouldn't believe it. Because you should have a different spirit in you that says, don't believe that stuff. Now we know, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, that a lie is going to be told in this world one of these days. A great deception is going to be unveiled in this world. And I don't know what that deception is, but I guarantee you, most everybody in the world, including a majority of church members, are going to fall for it and they're going to believe it. But God's truly elect are not. Because there is a different spirit in us that we just read the Bible and we say, you know what? I believe Noah's Ark. I believe it's still sitting somewhere on the mountains of Ararat. I believe there's a worldwide flood. I believe that whatever the tallest mountain was at that time, the waters were 15 cubits higher than that. That is exactly what I believe. And I don't believe Russell Crowe's inversion, a version of Noah. Who in here has seen that movie? It made me mad. It made me angry. I'm going, what are you? All right. We've already read all of that. Turn to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. Very quickly, I know I'm kind of running out of time, but this is the giant that David dealt with. Um, the purpose of this is to teach us what is going to happen. Now, typology and prophecy are always twofold. Number one, they're there to tell us the very last events that are going to take place in this world. But number two, they're there to tell us the events that are taking place in our life right now. Have you not ever had to face a giant? Something that was so big against you that you knew you had no power to conquer by yourself. A sin problem that you had no power against it. An addiction. Um, a problem with people. There was something there that you realized you had absolutely no power against it. And what the story of 1 Samuel and Goliath is here to tell you, it's not here to tell you that you're David that's going to beat Goliath because you're not David. David is a picture of Christ. You're the army of Israel that's sitting on the sidelines afraid because you know that you cannot defeat that giant. See, this Bible is not telling you Oh, you can be like David. You can defeat all the giants. No. There's on, there can only be one David. And that is Jesus Christ alone. David didn't whistle up some help and have some guys come and meet him to help him defeat Goliath. He did it on his own. It's 1 Samuel 17, 4. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits. If you were to take uh, a cubit as this long, between the tip of my elbow and the tip of my finger, and that's roughly 18 inches. Some people's cubits may be longer or whatever. So 18 inches times six cubits, so we think Goliath was somewhere around 9 to 10 feet tall. And again, Robert Wadlow, the Alton Giant, who's in the Guinness Book of World Records. By the way, if you go to Branson, Missouri, and go to Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, they have a, they have a life-size statue of him there. And you go stand next to it, that guy was big. And he was still growing. Okay? But he was no monster. And he was certainly no great warrior. Because he had feet this long. And when you got feet that long, you're going to trip over your own feet every time. Like me. So Goliath wasn't just somebody who was extraordinarily tall. He was his whole frame and his ratio. 
was big. Arms and muscles big and so on. There went a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. That's a, like a chain links of, uh, of like steel or iron or brass woven together so spears can't get through it. Um, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. Uh, I don't know what that relates to, but it's quite heavy. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs. It means he had like shin guards and leg coverings and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And those things are about this big around. So he had the ability to take a weaver's beam and throw it like we would a normal spear. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Now you have a connection between Goliath and the Iron Kingdom. And one bearing a shield went before him. If we look in verse 36, David said, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And we know from Revelation 13, verse 1, which is what I have on the screen. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. So if we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, David, in verse 49, David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So in this story, we have number one, you got to believe what it says. Number one, believe what it says. Because what you're seeing here, God is drawing a picture of what is going to happen in the last days. Because Revelation said the beast was like a lion and a leopard and a bear. David said that Goliath is like a lion and a bear. And I slew those lions and those bears. And I can slay this uncircumcised Philistine. So David is a picture of Christ. But I want you to understand then what I think the Bible's telling you about the nature and identity of the beast. Where did he come from? Is he some political figure that's really good at politics and he uses politics to take over the world? That's been tried. And it succeeds for a little while and then those kingdoms crumble. Besides that, one person can't control everybody on the, on the earth, can they? Not back then. But we're approaching a day where that's becoming more and more of a reality. So what is the Bible telling us then since it links Goliath with the beast of Revelation 13? Is that the beast, like Goliath, is a hybrid. He's part human. And he's part devil. Just like in Genesis 6. The sons of God and the daughters of men. And I'm going to go through in the Bible and show you that the Bible, when it says sons of God, it means exactly that. These are the gods that mated with human women and created a race of of kings on this earth that were able to carve out and move 1,000 ton stone blocks as if they were nothing. And I believe that's who this beast of Revelation 13 is going to be because it says, here's wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man mingled together 603 score and six and that's what the number six means so he's not just some guy that shows up that's really good at politics 
or else that would have been like Bill Clinton, right? Okay? He is a God-man and will have the power of a God to rule over the people of this world. They'll fall for it. They will. Let's stand to our feet.